Start by asking, as I usually do, if there's any questions about a uh, course or anything like that. Um, in this case, I'm uh, 1772 34. So this means actually he's a little bit older than Shelley. Shelley is 1775, So Colbert was born um, a little bit earlier and died actually quite a bit earlier than Shelley. No doubt due to his heavy use of opium. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, the, the influence was this way from Schelling's forward and not the other way. And the thing we read by Schelling was from 1800, whereas the things we're reading from Coleridge are later. So, uh, so uh, of course, he's best known as a romantic poet, right? the author of Lima, the Ancient Mariner, and Kubla Khan. Um, and a bunch of other poems. <laughs> uh, but he actually probably considered himself a philosopher, first and foremost. Um, and he did, um, although I guess I should say now he's mostly known as a romantic poet, there was a time in the history, especially of America, when the perceptions of him lined up with his perception of himself as a philosopher. And in fact, Coleridge is supposed to have said once, but I, I haven't found the original source of this quote, so I'm not sure he actually said it, but <laughs> um, so the quote is, I am a poor poet in England, but in America, I am a great philosopher. <laughs> right. Um, so that's relevant because the next two people we're reading after this are Americans. Um, And um, the two things we're reading by him are when read for today and a little bit of a reading for next time are from the friend. So the friend is was a newspaper, was but it wasn't, it was it was a newspaper written edited and published entirely by Coleridge. <laughs> just Coleridge newspaper. Um, and he had a bunch of subscribers, um, which means like subscribe means to like sign under, you know, like subscribers mean people who promise to pay for it if you publish it. <laughs> so he had a bunch of uh, subscribers. Nevertheless, uh, even with all those subscribers, he didn't uh, managed to make it a business success. Um, but it lasted, he published it for about two years, 1809 to 1810. Actually, though, the part that we're reading, the essays on the principle of method, were only added in 1818 when it was first republished in book form. So, A little bit later. Um, and um, these were actually originally intended as an introduction to an encyclopedia. <laughs> then they were uh, a little complicated, like this. Um, in 1818, they were added to the friend, which was published as a book. The other thing. from this aids to reflection, which, um, so the first edition was 1825. 
And the first edition was republished in America in 1829. Then later there was a second edition. 1831. Oh, um, because it's the first edition that was published in America, we're going to be reading from the first edition text, not from the second edition text. Um, so, um, in, in this American publication by uh, James Marsh, John Marsh, I mentioned him before, I think, the first president of the University of Vermont, <laughs> um, and kind of um, leader of Vermont transcendentalism, <laughs> was the one who published this with, a, with his own introductory essay in 1829, and it was very influential. Um, okay. Other than that, I don't have that much to say about Coleridge. I already mentioned uh, um, the famous opium use. Um, I already mentioned the famous plagiarism. <laughs> um, and uh, I guess one other thing, and I, I will come back to this a little bit, is that uh, like a number of romantic poets, he started off very radical like as a fan of the French Revolution. And he ended up very conservative as a Tory in a, a high church. And, um, this, this stuff we're reading is more towards the later, more conservative, especially this, but even this already, you can see a lot of that. Um, OK. Um, which didn't really carry over to his American problems, in fact. Interesting. But okay, anyway, I won't say anything more about that now. Okay, so this stuff is about the principle, the essay and the principle of method is about sometimes what is referred to as the science of method. Um, and what is the science of method, or what is method? So, um, so the, one of the first things Coleridge says about it in the reading, this is on page 450 or so. I guess it starts on 449. Rate that um, that for a person to be methodical is that we we sometimes describe as that them being like clockwork. And um, and he and he goes on there to say that um, the methodical person actually is like a clock in certain ways, only better, right? So, um, what does a clock do? Well, a clock is like a device for translating time into a space, basically. Right, like time is passing. Um, you can't, um, as with space, measure how much has passed by putting a ruler next to it. <laughs> right? But what you do is you use a clock, and the clock um, turns the, the like, inherently invisible passage of time. When I say it's inherently invisible, because there isn't one thing to see, right? Like the different parts of time aren't there at the same time, turns it into a measurable space. So but what Coleridge says about the methodical person is that they're better than a clock because um, the man 
in um, like, well, I'm not, I guess I'm not going to stop now and talk about use of the term man and gender pronouns. <laughs> um, obviously, it's uh, pervasive, not only in literature from the 19th century, but literature from the 1970s. <laughs> right. it, literally, if you read philosophy, it was published in the 1970s, like man, yeah, right. Um, so, but actually, I mean, these people were reading um, have have thoughts about that. They're not just oblivious to it. That's going to be especially true when we get to, to Margaret Fuller. So we talk about it more then. But in any case, so right for now, I'm just going to go on reading the way he wrote it. Um, but the man of methodological industry, sorry, of methodical industry. Again, this is on page 450. And honorable pursuits does more. Or right, I guess I should have started earlier. The resemblance extends beyond the point of regularity and yet falls short of the truth. Both do indeed at once divide and announce the silent and otherwise indistinguishable lapse of time. But the man of methodical industry and honorable pursuits does more. He realizes its ideal divisions and gives a character and individuality to its moments. So, um, The methodical man realizes the ideal divisions of time. This term realize is should be familiar from Schelling. Um, I mean, it actually comes from Kant. Kant doesn't use it exactly in this way, or I mean, at least not according to me. Maybe according to Schelling and Coleridge, he does. <laughs> but anyway, um, the methodical man realizes the ideal divisions of time. Right? Time is the um, the result of the activity of the self. The way it constantly progresses, it's ideal. But the methodical man, like the clock, makes ideal divisions of time into realities, into external objects. But um, um, whereas the clock does that basically like arbitrarily, <laughs> the methodical man is giving is realizing the ideal divisions of time in their individuality and their individual characteristics. That is, the external object that, that is created by or, act, or just is the activity of this methodical person um, is um, um, Gives time a purposeful structure. It, um, it causes it to have parts that go together in a certain way for a reason. Um, so, um, That partly is why, like, the obvious, um, the obvious importance of being methodical is in practice more than in theory. Right? I mean, what's going on here from a practical point of view is that, um, as Coleridge puts it a little bit later on 450, um, Actually, it's the very next sentence. If the idol are described as killing time, he may justly be just he may be justly said to call it into life and moral being, 
Well, he makes it the distinct object, not only of the consciousness, but of the conscience. So, um, I mean, from a practical point of view, what's going on is that um, I'm becoming responsible for using time in the right way. Or I'm, um, right, that is giving time a moral being. So the clock obviously in itself doesn't do that. The clock will always just keep generating this external object, um, but uh, and it can remind me what I'm supposed to do at a certain time. But it's up to me to have things that I'm supposed to do. <laughs> the clock can't do that, right? And so uh, and Coleridge goes on in the next sentence to say something even more, even stronger about this. He organizes the hours and gives them a soul. Right? So organizes means the methodical person from a practical point of view is making the parts of time into organs. Right, remember, I, well, at least I think I talk about this briefly when I talk about natural teleology, right? Natural teleology means that, like, um, a living thing has a purpose inherent in it. It is, so to speak, its own purpose, right? Its purpose is to be itself or to maintain itself. Um, and, uh, but, that's what uh, makes, that's why a living being is an organized being, or organic, right? Organon in Greek means like a tool or a piece of equipment. So when Aristotle said that the soul is the um, perfection or entelechy of an organized body, he meant it's a body that um, whose parts are tools for a certain purpose, and the purpose is the soul. So, so Coleridge is saying that the, the methodical person actually, um, rather than killing time, makes time alive. <laughs> Um, so it makes it into the kind of external object that um, um, it represents or re reflects an idea or a purpose, a principle um, that an intelligent being can um, uh, try to follow. Okay, so all of that, like I said, is about is like in the first instance about it's about the practical um, importance of method. So Coleridge, you know, immediately after discussing that, goes on to say that this essay is going to be about the theoretical works of method, and you know, and that is. What it mostly talks about, although it's also part, sometimes is about the interference between the two, like the way theoretical method can can in someone like Hamlet can interfere with the ability to actually do things. <laughs> it's out of balance somehow. Um, but um, but nevertheless, and I think it's not surprising if you compare this to Schelling. I mean, that these two are closely related somehow, right? I mean, the, the reason method is going to be important in theory is going to be similar to the reason it's important in practice because um, knowing the world also ultimately depends on um, understanding the world as an expression of a principle that I have in me. Um, 
So um, I guess actually there is one thing I should say about this. I mean, and this is the type of thing that, you know, I mean, it would be nice to say, and it might have sounded like I was saying that, that look, this, you know, man for these people, just, uh, just don't attach that much, you know, importance to it. That's what everyone says, whatever. But the truth is that when um, um, Coleridge gives two examples, one of a methodical person and the other of an unmethodical person. The methodical person is Hamlet, and the unmethodical person is Mrs. Quickly. <laughs> right? So the methodical man is a man. <laughs> the unmethodical person is not a man, but rather a woman. Um, and I don't think that's a coincidence, um, although I don't know what else to say about it other than it's not a coincidence. <laughs> All right. Um, so okay, so 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 this is roughly what we're talking about here. That the reason method is so important is um, that method has to do with um, finding the ideal or the unified principle of of the intelligence in the external object. That's why it's going to be crucial. That's why it's crucial for practice, but it's also why it's crucial for science, according to Coleridge. Um, and it's also somehow going to be related to why it's important for art. Um, okay, so to try to explain more about, um, uh, I mean, like the details of how Coleridge thinks this works out and why also it's related to education, which is what he actually starts with talking about, um, is um, that to be methodical in theory is supposed to be equivalent to this, which is what he says on page 451. Um, method become, well, I guess this isn't only theory. This is theory. He's still talking more about practice here. Method, therefore, becomes natural to the mind which has been accustomed to contemplate not things only or for their own sake alone, but likewise and chiefly the relations of things. So, so method is like realizing the ideal in the organic. But it's also um, paying attention to Relations instead of things, or instead of at least instead of only things, um, realize I'm really writing on the wrong side of the board, I'm writing on the part of the board that I blocked when I steamed you <laughs> from the camera, but oh well. Uh, no, no, you can't see me at all. So I would have to move this here. So it's a lot of focus. I mean, this is not what we do with that. All right. Um, because I'm oh, sorry. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming that that some people are going to watch the recording since there's like three people here in person and one by Zoom. So the other people, I hope, watch the recordings. Um, 
Anyway, um, so, okay, so, um, why is it that being methodical means paying attention to relations instead of just to things? Um, I mean, so, like, there is a thought kind of floating around, especially in Leibniz and maybe sort of in Locke also, that um, the absolute predicates of things are real, whereas the relative predicates are ideal. Right? So, like, um, when I when I think this has a certain quantity, um, then what I'm thinking of is a property that this thing actually has in it. But when I think this is bigger than this, there isn't anything that has that property, right? It's my mind comparing these two things. Um, so that, I mean, that would be a way of understanding what's going on here. I, I, I think it gets some distance towards understanding that, but I think, um, first of all, that Kant and Schelling wouldn't agree with that, what I just said, that the absolute predicates are real and the relative predicates are ideal. Right? I mean, one of Kant's big points in the first critique and elsewhere, actually, is that um, that objects of our cognition are um, essentially relative. And then we think, like when Leibniz thinks that couldn't be true, it's because he misunderstands the type of cognitive faculty we have or the type of objects could, we could know. Um, so, right, so like, what is a body? Well, body is just, you know, what excludes other bodies from its space. So it can only be understood what it is relative to other bodies. Um, I mean, this is the, well, okay, I shouldn't spend too much time talking about that, but, um, cause I could spend a lot of time talking about that, but, um, so, I mean, uh, um, I don't, you couldn't simply apply that salute that theory from Leibniz or Locke here to explain what Coleridge means. But I think um, you can understand it better if you think that what Coleridge means by relation isn't just what um, I guess Hume calls a philosophical relation or mix, just call it like any two place predicate. <laughs> You know, so like bigger than is a relation, smaller than is a relation, anything where you can supply two things and ask whether it's true of them is a relation. Um, Coleridge is thinking of a relation as um, um, implying some kind of metaphysical dependence between things. So when we say that two things are related, we mean that they're derivable according to a common principle. And um, this is another, like, uh, I think this is a common way of thinking about where, what relation is among post-Kantian idealists and uh, therefore also Marvel neo-Kantians and other people later on, that by relation we mean, um, so it's like, um, relation meaning that somehow one of them actively relates to the other, and that's why the other is there, or something. So, like the relation of succession of the numbers, what kind of like produces the numbers? They, at least, that's the way these people think about it. It's not um, as if you have a bunch of things sitting there, numbers, and you ask. Okay, which one of these comes after this one? It's that the relation of coming after actually is what allows you to derive all the numbers from a principle. That's the kind of relation I think that Coleridge is thinking about. And that um, um, is something that 
Kant and Schelling would agree is essentially ideal, right? That is that kind of um, um, unified principle to which things must necessarily correspond. That's something that occurs in an intellect or understanding. So, um, so paying attention to relations of things, that is of the real, right? The word for thing is, in Latin is race. That's what real comes from. So paying attention to the relations of things means somehow realizing ideal principles in things. And the two relations that, well, actually, so Coleridge says, and I think, you know, um, what I just said about how he's thinking about relation, um, helps to explain this. Otherwise, it would sound weird. He says, well, there's two relations <laughs> that are relevant here. Why only two? Then it, it turns out it's actually three, which is also similar to things that happen in Shell. But there's two relations. What are the two relations? And the two relations are, let's say five, about the first one, which is law, and essay six is about the second one, which is theory. By the way, last time I taught the course, I assigned essay five. I didn't assign six through nine, and I assigned essay 10. So it turned out essay 10 wasn't really interesting. And I thought essay six is so closely connected to five, and then seven also seemed like it was, it was interesting, but now I realize seven isn't that interesting. And essay six, or I mean, I don't know, it's interesting, but it's not. Like doesn't fit that well into. It's about polar. It's like a lot of details about Florida's understanding of electricity and magnetism and stuff like that. Um, but yeah. So anyway, um, but essay five and at least the beginning of essay six are are really important because it's where he discusses these two different relations. Um, and then what it turns out the third one is. Um, between these, this is on page 464, between these two lies the me lies method in the fine arts, right? So, um, this shouldn't be surprising coming from Sean, but the third one, um, where we thought uh, there was only going to be two, the third one turns out to be art. Um, okay, but I'm going to talk about the first two first. Um, unless, are there questions going on? Okay. So the first relation is law. And law involves um, a prior ideal unity. It's an ideal unity um, from which all plurality is first derived. And in fact, he says that law itself, law with a capital L, is the prior ideal unity. It's prior to all plurality in general. Like this is on page 459. Um, we have thus assigned the first place in the science of method to law. And first of the first, to law as the absolute kind, which comprehending in itself the substance of every possible degree 
precludes from its conception all degree, not by generalization, but by its own plentitude. So, right, so when he's talking about law as the kind of universal or like single principle that includes everything that falls under it, not because it abstracts from them, but because it implies all of them. Um, right, this is famous from Hegel, it's like the concrete universal. <laughs> um, but it's, um, but, you know, like if you think of the example of the numbers, um, think of them as generated by the successor relation. It's not like the successor relation isn't something that all the numbers have in common. There, there isn't very much that all the numbers have in common. Right, each one has its own individual characteristics. Um, but the successor relation implies all of those. They're all derivable from it. That's the kind of universal we're thinking of here. Um, and, and because that's the kind of universal we're thinking of here, law itself, Gorge is saying is the universal from which all universals like this are derived. <laughs> it's the absolute principle of principles. Um, and as he, he goes on, as such, therefore, and as the sufficient cause of the reality correspondent thereto, we contemplate it as exclusively an attribute of the supreme being, inseparable from the idea of God. Um, so this obviously has a kind of Neoplatonist sound to it. I mean, um, like a strict Neoplatonist would say that um, that law understood this way is the supreme being, not that it's an attribute of the supreme being. To say that it's an attribute of the supreme being is like uh, Aristotelian Neoplatonism. <laughs> do, do you understand what I just said at all? <laughs> right, like uh, Aristotelians believe that, you know, that, that um, individuals are, so to speak, metaphysically prior to their attributes. Now, right now, like when you talk about everyday things, you, you know, it's really, it's kind of easy to understand what that means you know, like what they really are is horses. And then like the, the property of being a horse is only realized in the individual horses or something like that. When you talk about God and the one beyond being and stuff like that, it becomes a little bit trickier to understand what if anything is going on. But but it's still between Platonists and Aristotelians, they're still the same, right? Where the Platonists say, no, what comes first is horse, the form. <laughs> And the individuals are secondary, right? So similarly, in the case of God, you know, a, a true Neoplatonist will say that this universal is God, or is a God if it's proper. But anyway, <laughs> um, but whereas the Aristotelian will say it's an attribute of God. So that's that's what Orange is saying. It's, so it's a kind of Aristotelianism, but it's Aristotelianism that's very Platonizing. <laughs> So, I mean, so that's one thing you can hear when he says that, but it also, not by coincidence, sounds kind of Schelling-like. I say not by coincidence because Schelling is also interested in Neoplatonism. Um, so, um, um, because, uh, Another way of putting this is to say, you know, there's this uh, one eternal, single, um, infinite in the sense that it's prior to all plurality principle. 
call that the infinite activity. And the, the finite activity of um, the things is somehow just a result of that. Okay, um, so that's the relationship of law. The, whereas the other relation is the relation of what Coleridge calls theory. So, I mean, I wrote it before practice and theory. This is a different use of theory than theory versus practice. This is the use of theory um, where theory is like a hypothesis or something. Okay. Um, and um, so it's, it's, I mean, it's a kind of pejorative use of theory, right? Like you say, well, that's just a theory. <laughs> um, and, and Coleridge does think that this, this principle is first and this one is second because this one's better. <laughs> Um, but nevertheless, both of these relations are, are, are involved in, um, I think both of these relations are included under being methodical, um, like paying attention to these types of relations. Both of them are included in being methodical. It's just that this one is better. So what is this one? What's the difference? So basically what he calls theory is that it's um, it's unity gathered after the fact. I guess to say after maybe out of plurality. That is, it's, you know, um, after I've been manifoldly affected in the order of time and space, I stand back and I try to find some principle according to which all those effects that happen to me could be derived. Um, so, um, Right, so, so Coleridge claims in the history of science in particular that both of these are necessary, but that this one comes first. And then at a certain point when the science, um, as we might say, we like we meaning like 20th century philosophers of science, <laughs> not we, but anyway, <laughs> as we might say, when the science becomes mature, when it becomes a mature science, it makes a transition from considering things according to this kind of relation to considering things according to this kind of relation. Right, so this is what Coleridge thinks happens when, you know, like when Newton um, transforms celestial mechanics by finding the, the necessity according to which all the motions follow. Um, uh, and um, it's that the science of electricity in his time is on the brink of making this transition, whereas the science of chemistry, for example, has not, or botany, has not made it. Or even the science of magnetism, right? He makes that distinction. He says that the electricians are, although they don't quite realize it yet, are on the track of this, whereas the magneticians are very calm, are still really in this stage. Um, um, so, I mean, it's one thing that's interesting about that is that like, if you're to take philosophy of science when I teach it next quarter, you see that um, Thomas Kuhn focuses on this same period in the development of the science of electricity and describes basically the same transition that Coleridge is talking about, only, of course, from a completely different point of view, like his diagnosis of why what has happened and you know so forth is completely different but they both notice the same change so to speak but um in any case i mean uh this this version of the history of science is not congenial not only not congenial to kuhn but not congenial to like any of the people we read in 125 next quarter it's a it's a 
rationalist version of the history of science. Um, right? Like instead of looking at that for at least for this course, that instead of the Galileo whose whose achievement or whose um, innovation was that he discovered that or used the telescope. He didn't discover the telescope. He, you know, he went out and looked at things with the telescope. Um, as you know, I guess the idea of the Aristotelian never bothered to do that or whatever. That's where the, that's where the revolution in science came from. This is the Galileo who discovered that, as Galileo actually said, the book of nature is written in the language of mathematics. Right, so what made modern science possible, at least in physics, was initially was Galileo's recognition that whatever is real is that what is real is exactly what conforms to a certain kind of principle I have in me. That's the way rationalists understand that transition, and that's so. And that's so. Coleridge fits broadly into that um, as showing were too. Um, okay, so um, so what both of these have in common then, um, only this one does it better, <laughs> is that um, they they take that order of um, time and space, right? That order in which things just happen to affect me, and they reduce it, that is, lead it back to or derive it out of an intellectual order, an order that follows from a principle in me. Um, and Coleridge says, so, you know, this is how that sh this shows up on the grand level of, like, science, you know, development of science. But he says, and in general, and this is like the whole, I mean, I'm doing this out of, not in the order that Coleridge does it. <laughs> I basically agree with Coleridge about this in a sense, right? That like, to the extent that, that I talk about things in a lecture or in something I've written and the order is just the order of the underlying text, that means I haven't completely processed it, right? <laughs> If I really understood it, it would be my order, not Florence's order. <laughs> so anyway, that's kind of incomplete here, but um, but I am discussing it, right? Like essay five and six is where he talks about this. But going back to essay four, um, that whole thing about the difference between Hamlet and Mrs. Quickly and so on and so forth is about how that. Um, um, education shows itself, manifests itself, and so education is basically being taken to mean the habit of method, the acquired habit of method. Being educated manifests itself in um, the order of your words as you discuss something, not following the spatio-temporal order of what you're talking about, but rather a conceptual order. Um, so, you know, and the, um, so I'll just read this on page 454. Um, Um, the uneducated and unreflecting talker overlooks all mental relations, both logical and psychological, and consequently precludes all method that is not purely accidental. Hence, the nearer the things and incidents in time and place, the more distant, disjointed, and impertinent to each other and to any common purpose will they appear in his narration. And this from the want of a staple or starting post in the narrative himself, from the absence of the leading thought, 
So what's missing in an uneducated person is this leadership of thought, which kind of musters all the things that you're going to talk about into its own order. Um, and so um, the more the uneducated person, like Mrs. Quickly, is talking about things that happen at the same time, the more they'll just be a um, uh, kind of random list of like in order of, of things in order in which they happened or whatever without any conceptual connection. Um, Right, and then as he says on page 455, on the contrary, where the habit of method is present and effective, things the most remote and diverse in time, place, and outward circumstances are brought into mental contiguity and succession. The more striking as the less expected. So, I mean, Again, you can see, say, see that this is kind of like what a clock does, only better. Because another way of explaining what a clock does is that um, the whole dial of the clock establishes a kind of relationship between events at different times that isn't just succession of one after the other. Because um, the same time will come again tomorrow. And so I can talk about what happens at three o'clock. <laughs> hey, and it's only because of the clock that I can do that. Otherwise, if I, you know, I would just, I would have to just think of all the things that are going to happen between this three o'clock and next three o'clock, so to speak. I mean, not literally, right? People have other ways of telling time besides mechanical clocks, but that's the idea. So, um, I mean, the sun does it, which actually is going to be relevant in a second. But, um, um, but again, it's better than the way the clock does it. The clock just arbitrarily associates everything that happens at three o'clock on every day. Um, whereas the person of method is going to have an actual like organic principle, there's going to be a reason why these things are discussed. Um, next to each other, even though they happen at different times or in different places. Um, right, so like when an educated person tells a story, they might not tell it in chronological order, what, what Coleridge is calling the educated person, um, because they're going to um, tell you things in the order in which they're connected to each other. Um, so, uh, um, you know, if what happened next is irrelevant to the story, they're going to skip it. Or if you really have to know what happened in the end to understand what was going on in the beginning, they'll tell you that first, etc. So to be educated is um, um, to be educated is that is to be naturally or habitually methodical is to contemplate events and images only insofar as the mind can classify them and appropriate them. Um, right, appropriate means like make them my own, make them my own, um, and thereby imposes um, 
Um, and so far, is it, therefore, the mind, uh, by doing that, by appropriating them, imposes its own order on them. Now, I mean, the case of Hamlet shows that uh, there's there's a limit to this, that if it's done in the wrong way, it can go too far. Um, I mean, um, the, what goes wrong in the case of Hamlet is um, in some ways just as disturbing as what goes wrong in the case of Mrs. Quickly, but uh, Coleridge wants to point out in going through like what Hamlet actually says, um, like what kind of disturbance it is and why it's so it's such a different kind of disturbance than we see in the Mrs. Quickly speech, namely that um, the problem is in Hamlet that as he's trying to tell this story, which is really just uh, some events that happened to him, he can't stop from intruding um, general permanent principles into the story. Um, right, so this is um, all the digressions and enlargements consist of this is page 452. Um, by a peculiar, by a trait which is indeed peculiarly characteristic of Hamlet's mind, ever disposed to generalize and meditative to excess but which with due abatement and reduction is distinctive of every powerful and methodizing intellect. All the digressions and enlargements consist of reflections, truths, and principles of general and permanent interest, either directly expressed or disguised in playful satire. So, um, right, generality and permanence are characteristics of the ideal unified the reign of order um, and Hamlet is overimposing them on his material um, this material so to speak isn't um, strong enough to bear them um, and that's why it um, that intrusion of like theoretical ideology it gets to the point where it interferes with his ability to act. Um, as Horatio points out, right, Horatio says in response to Hamlet, like, well, to consider so would be to consider too curiously, which, I mean, curious can mean different things in, in this period, but I think uh, the prob it probably means either like too subtly um, or too strangely or something like that. But in any case, like Horatio is saying, you know, that's the point where, where Hamlet stops to observe that like Alexander the Great can, you know, has been used to stop a hole in a barrel or something like that. And uh, Horatio is like, you know, that's not really relevant right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, um, so there's a problem either way, but obviously, at least according to Coleridge, obviously Hamlet's problem is not as as disastrous to knowledge or action as Mrs. Quigley's problem is. The problem is that Hamlet has applied this principle of order, which is what you need to think or act correctly, but he's applied it out of due measure or something like that. And that's also why Coleridge says that when you get to the to be or not to be soliloquy, um, that there Coleridge claims um, because the subject matter is is sufficient to support Hamlet's intellect, then what Hamlet says is correct. Um, 
Okay, so I think, you know, with that, I, I think I finished talking about the main outline of what Coleridge means by method here and why he thinks it's so important and so forth. Then there's, but there's two other really important things I want to discuss. So one is the political implications of this, and the other is the aesthetic implications or implications for aesthetics. Um, but before, are there questions about this before I go on? Questions from the internet? Okay. Um, it helps to have more students who get more questions. <laughs> anyway, um, so um, the political implication, I mean, um, so Coleman just doesn't directly talk about politics in this passage, but it's like everywhere um, hinted at or alluded to. Um, and I think, you know, um, these terms like law and imposition of order and the leading class. So these obviously are like political metaphors, but I think for Coleridge they're more than just metaphors. <laughs> um, so, um, Um, so like, if you look at the quote from Bacon, Francis Bacon on page 458. Um, so, so this is the quote in, um, Coleridge's translation. But if you have at heart the advancement of education, as that which proposes to itself the general discipline of the mind for its end and aim. Be less anxious, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's supposed to be a quote from Bacon, only actually, if you look in the Latin, you'll see that all that whole long phrase, education, as that which proposes to itself the general discipline of the mind for its end and aim. corresponds to one Latin word, <laughs> discipline. <laughs> That's what Bacon actually says. Otherwise, this translation is fairly literal. <laughs> but at that point, Coleridge like expanded it into this big thing to explain why education and discipline are the same thing. Um, so, um, and obviously, if education and discipline are really the same thing, then um, then there is a more than met metaphorical connection between this the use of this language and talking about theory and whatever, and the use of this the the literal political use of this language. Um, so um, I think that what the connection is comes out most clearly on page 455. So this is like, I read the stuff that's around this, but I didn't read this particular part. So I'm going to go back um, to the top of page 455. The absence of the leading thought, which borrowing a phrase from the nomenclature of legislation, we may not inaptly call the initiative. That's what the unmethodical person lacks, the leading thought, which, borrowing a phrase from the domain, apparently, I always wondered whether this should be pronounced nomenclature or nomenclature, but apparently, according to Wiktionary, nomenclature is American, and nomenclature, nomenclature is <laughs> All right. Um, so, borrowing a phrase from the nomenclature of legislation, we may not inaptly call the initiative. What is initiative 
the nomenclature of legislation. So initiative means um, a branch of government is said to have the that um, a branch of government is said to have the initiative if it can first propose or like be the first actor in doing something as opposed to just being able to react to it perhaps to veto it or whatever after the fact um but this is one of the quotes for initiative in the oed this is from william godwin um, just this just been reading some of this actually it's like this really extreme anarchist guy <laughs> late 18th century anyway um this is the quote from william godwin which has nothing to do with anarchism or directly the legislative assembly whether it possesses the initiative or a power of control only in executive affairs that's the quote from godwin right so you see so what he's asking is like in executive affairs can the legislative assembly start things off? Like, can the legislative assembly get together and say, um, okay, um, you know, so-and-so is going to be appointed to this job or we're going to have a war or whatever, these executive functions, or do they only have control, meaning that like um, they can, regulate the way the executive can do these things but they can't actually make any of them happen right so, they, so so that's what initiative here means and what coleridge is saying is that um, um in the unmethodical or um uneducated person um thought doesn't have the initiative it only has control but not the initiative whereas the methodical person thought has the initiative um so um or i mean or actually i'm not sure maybe he's saying that in the methodical unmethodical person the problem is that not only thought but also the senses or whatever have initiative um so i that is i think what he's hinting here is that the constitution and he uses the word constitution in the next paragraph with what a profound insight into the constitution of the human soul is this exhibited to us in the character of the prince of denmark what he's saying is that the constitution of the educated soul is a kind of limited monarchy in which um thought or the understanding has certain prerogatives and including the initiative and executive affairs and the popular assembly so to speak that is the sensibility or the objective um uh can't intrude on that prerogative and therefore what he's implying is so that's like the constitution of the educated soul so what he's implying is that Whigs who want to uh do away with royal prerogatives are trying to reduce Britain to the state of an uneducated soul. <laughs> um, I mean, uh, um, I'm pretty sure that's what he's saying here. And it's, I mean, it's all, like not surprising. And it, like he's been quoted from Plato, Plato's Republic in this context. It's not right. That's the whole plot of Plato's Republic is something like um you know if we want to know what a just soul is let's first figure out what a just city is right it's that analogy is made at the beginning of the republic 
So um, Coleridge is, so to speak, doing the same thing backwards. Um, and uh, you know, when you when you look at it that way, I think you can also understand how the kind of opposite problem, like the Hamlet problem, um, how what how Coleridge is understanding that politically, because what he says about that is, um, this is also on page 455. But while we would impress the necessity of this habit, that is the habit of method, the illustrations adduced give proof that in undue preponderance, and when the prerogative of the mind is stretched into despotism, the discourse may degenerate into the grotesque or the fantastical. Right? So what he's saying is that like in Hamlet's case, where um, too much per prerogative is given to thought, that is the monarchy is not limited enough, um, then the discourse, Hamlet's discourse degenerates into the grotesque or the fantastical. Grotesque and fantastical, I think, will make his readers think of Catholicism. <laughs> right? So what he's saying is, um, um, like very much what Burke said, that yes, the glorious revolution was necessary. The glorious revolution replaced James the second, who wanted to move England towards Catholicism with William and Mary, who um, were Protestant, um, and uh, um, and also at the same time established certain limits on royal prerogatives. But the Whigs and the Tories both said that the Glorious Revolution was glorious, but the argument about was about exactly what it meant. <laughs> um, yeah. So Coleridge is is I think is. Trying to give like a deep philosophical explanation of why the Tory understanding is correct. <laughs> the glorious revolution was necessary because royal prerogative can't be allowed to get too far. Then you get Catholicism. <laughs> but uh, um, but uh, if you were to eliminate royal prerogative completely, then you would get like, barbarism, I guess. Or, well, barbarism or some thinking, then you would get Presbyterianism. <laughs> All right. Um, um, okay, so that's what I wanted to say about the political angle here. Um, and that's also why I said it's clear that, you know, I mean, aids to reflection is like, we'll see, is all about defending some, like, Anglican orthodoxy, whatever, but um, but you can see even here in 1818, he's he's like he's moved in a very conservative direction. Um, okay, so what about art, however? So as I mentioned, art is that third relation besides law and theory. Yes, he actually doesn't cut. He says it method in the fine arts. So why is this different from both of the other two, and how is it related to them? Well, so I think when he introduces that, he's definitely left Kant and gone on to Shell. Like, oh. I guess you could have said that about all the stuff I was saying, lately. but anyway, um, but this is the particular thing he's bringing in there. Because, I mean, this, this is the thing that, that Kant definitely wouldn't agree with. Because nature itself, meaning that um, apparently disorganized, um, contingent order of time and space in which events happen really is 
follow the effect of an infinite ideal activity. The imagination can act, or Coleridge adds, uh, or Schelling doesn't say this, or passion can take the place of intellect here. And perhaps in an even stronger way. So he says this when he's discussing um, Lear. We have seen that from the confluence of innumerable impressions in each moment of time, the mere passive memory must needs tend to confusion. A rule, the seeming exceptions to which, parentheses, the thunder bursts in Lear, for instance, are really confirmations of its truth. For in many instances, the predominance of some mighty passion takes the place of the guiding thought. And the result, so, I mean, so far, this sounds consistent with, remember what I was saying about, like, for Aristotle or Kant, like, the imagination can be, like, a second-rate substitute for intellect or understanding. <laughs> um, but it's the thing that he says next that goes beyond that. And the result presents the method of nature rather than the habit of the individual. Right, so so um, when the I'm gonna draw this, but like, here's this order of events that as they actually happen in space and time. Now, um, so one way that I can impose order on that is by using my understanding or intellect to impose, like consciously impose my principle on it. And classify and connect and whatever. But the other way um, Coleridge is saying is that um, I can let my imagination connect them to each other. Um, or some mighty passion. Let them connect things with each other. And Coleridge says that when that happens, the result presents the method of nature rather than the habit of an individual. That is, in some sense, this is actually going to be a stronger kind of imposition of order. Because the method of nature means that like, the infinite activity actually is responsible for this order. I remember how Schelling explain why there is a time order. It's because the infinite ego is, um, in order to make the finite ego, the ego its object, is setting up this boundary, which also always has to be pushed beyond. That's why there is an order of time to begin with. So, um, so if by way of the imagination or some mighty passion, I can, so to speak, have access to that ordering principle, then everything will follow from that. Um, and he adds, this is the next sentence, for thought, imagination, and we may add passion, are in their very essence, the first connected, the latter, Co-adunitive. This is not a normal image for me. <laughs> but um, it has it has unitive in it. Right? So it's like I mean, it is in the dictionary, like if, but I think if you look it up in the OED, you'll find this sentence <laughs> as an example. <laughs> so uh, uh, it's um, like it adds, it, it um, unites 
things onto together or something. <laughs> That's like, right, it's unitive. It's like it unites things with add and code. <laughs> so it like unites things onto each other together or something like that. I, I, like, I think uh, if I understood Coleridge better or understood this word better, I could probably explain exactly why he, he, he wants to say this rather than just like unitive or unifying. Right? I mean, there's obviously a reason that, um, that he introduced this bizarre word. Like one of the things he, he first says, like the beginning of essay four is that the educated person is, will have learned from experience that you don't you don't introduce unusual words unless you really have to. <laughs> right? So uh, Coleridge often does introduce unusual words, but we can tell from that that he thinks he really has to. <laughs> but I don't know exactly how to explain this, but I but what I do think is that the contrast between connected co-adunitive is supposed to be that like um, connection, I mean, this is what Kant says, characterizes thought too, connection or nexus. Um, like, um, it's, uh, like the nexus of cause and effect. <laughs> um, this is also how Hume uses the term connection sometimes. It's, um, it's about uh, classifying effects together with their causes um, or in general, things that necessarily go together, right? Like distinct existence that necessarily go together. What Hume says never happens. <laughs> That's what connection is about. So thought like takes disparate things and shows how they're necessarily related. But coadunitive means that the imagination or this mighty passion somehow shows that these are all one. Right? Like just um, not that there are plurality that's related to each other by by necessity, but that they're ultimately all the same or something like that. Right, so that's, that's I think, is his way of saying that when imagination or passion is, um, is taking the place of intellect or method, it actually, what it can actually do that's stronger than intellect or method, or I guess he's, I mean, he says it's a kind of relation or method. So, but it's stronger than this kind, maybe I should say, is that um, it can lead to the realization, to the consciousness that this is really just all the expression of a single, um, unified activity. So, I mean, I know that may, that may sound like exactly what I said about law before, and it is, I mean, I think, I mean, it's supposed to be, right, like, just as in Schelling, the work of the genius artist is, is supposed to be, like, basically what the philosopher is doing with the intellect. Um, it does ultimately come to the same thing, but whereas the intellect has to do it, I guess you could say painstakingly by noticing all these necessary connections, the imagination or the passion just like directly reduces everything to one, something like that. Um, So, um, so I think this helps um, 
explain what Coleridge is trying to do with Shakespeare here, or with the, with the like similarity and difference between Plato and Shakespeare. I mean, um, you know, like, why are we referring to Shakespeare? Is Shakespeare a philosopher? Does Shakespeare have a theory of like the infinite activity and realization and all that stuff? Well, I mean, you know, so there's different ways of going at that. Um, one way would be to say, well, yeah, I mean, in a kind of fancy, like, or poetic way, Shakespeare does introduce some philosophical theses, right? So the thing that um, um, the first digression that Hamlet makes when he's telling the story of being on the ship, again, I'm kind of I'm assuming that people have done the reading. If you haven't, uh, you know, well, anyway, Hamlet is telling the story of being on a ship yeah, in the middle, he, uh, and, you know, and how he couldn't sleep, and he just like rashly decided to go look at the orders that the ambassadors had, um, even though he wasn't supposed to. So he says, rashly, and praise be rashness for it. And then there's the digression. Let us know our indiscretion sometimes serves us well when our deep plots do fail. And that should teach us there's a divinity that shapes our ends, rough hew them how we will. So that thing that, that Hamlet says there is basically like a version of this very philosophical thesis, right? He's saying that, you know, um, sometimes when our methodical like rational attempts to figure out what we should do next fails and we rashly do something else that um, we're actually expressing the divine plan so it's not only a version of this but it's a version of what we saw in Schelling and like that and what heck right like hamlet is is saying something like that um even though uh you know, Shakespeare's writing before all those people. <laughs> Hamlet is saying something like that. Um, so, um, so you know, that would be one way to think of Shakespeare as containing a philosophical message that you would say, well, look, his characters are saying philosophical things. Um, the thing about that is, though, that you know, all we learn from the fact that Hamlet says that is that Shakespeare is capable of entertaining that thought. What we don't know is whether Shakespeare would maintain that or whether only Hamlet maintains that. Now, I mean, so in a way, this is why Coleridge so to speak, says that Plato is the closest philosopher to Shakespeare or vice versa. It's the same problem you can have when reading Plato, right? Socrates will say something. It's definitely a philosophical thesis, but, but if you want to know whether Plato thinks that, it's not necessarily easy to tell. So, um, I mean, the truth is it's not necessarily easy to tell whether Socrates thinks that either. The character, <laughs> but, you know, but so in any case, um, 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 so so that approach will to to showing that there's something philosophical in Shakespeare um, is unsatisfactory. <laughs> um, so Coleridge's interpretation is that. Shakespeare actually doesn't have his characters say these things in order to teach us something about the content of what they're saying. So the point of Hamlet saying this philosophical thesis is not for Shakespeare to express that philosophical thesis. Um, rather, the point is to display the way a mind like Hamlet or Horatio or Mrs. Quigley thinks and speaks. <laughs> 
And then from that, if we think about that, um, we can get to a point which none of those characters themselves could articulate. Um, like, for example, the point that Coward was making about the difference between Hamlet and this right? Neither of them articulates that. Um, and yet, Shakespeare, if it's if he convincingly inhabits those minds and speaks the way they would, he to teach us something about that, about what method uh, is and what happens when you don't have it and what happens when you have too much of it and so forth. Um, so, um, of course, uh, it takes Coleridge, right? That is, it takes a philosopher, or at least um, uh, someone like Plato, who the, the philosopher is more like predominates over the poet, <laughs> at least in Coleridge's own, own mind. It takes someone like Coleridge to read Hamlet and tell us the, in black and white all the stuff about it. Um, Hamlet and in the Henry the Sixth Part One, but anyway, um, so uh, um, so so you might think this is just a way of saying that like oh, Shakespeare suggests something to philosophers, but I think that what Coleridge actually is saying and um, at least I think what Coleridge actually is thinking here is something more like what um, Schelling was thinking about the artistic genius. And we'll see later Fuller saying this explicitly about Plato, about Hamlet in particular, actually. But um, um, it's actually what Shakespeare is doing is saying the same thing Coleridge is saying, but in a way that everyone can understand. I mean, that doesn't allow them to then turn around and talk like Polish. But that's not the point, right? Because Shakespeare can represent the unity of the finite and the infinite in this finite object, the play Hamlet, in a way that you don't have to be a philosopher to get. It. So, okay, that's everything I wanted to say, and we're out of time. So, thank you for coming. <laughs>